As you know, the pastor asked me to teach this morning, and I'm always happy to serve the Lord because I know the Lord's going to show me something. And of course, He did. And uh, get rid of this before, because I'm when, once I get going, it's going to be fast. The name of this lesson is consuming fire. Deuteronomy chapter four verse twenty four says. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, my blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I need your help. I pray that you'll fill me with your power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that you teach this message and just give this vessel the strength to get through it. I pray that you'll bless each one here, and Lord, help us to walk away from here with an image of God that we didn't have when we came in. For we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 repeats it, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 says, It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because His compassion fails not. We have a God that is a consuming fire. We, we've been brainwashed for years to visualize our Savior as this little meek, mild, wussy guy walking around with a beard and sandals. That is not who our God is. If you have that vision, you need to get rid of it. Our God is a consuming fire. He's all-powerful. He's almighty. And there's nothing about Him that you can say is a weakness. He has no weaknesses. He knows your heart. You can't fool with Him. You can't trifle with Him. You have to believe that the Lord God is an almighty God and that you have to deal with Him with a con contrite heart. Not with pride or not with, not with uh, bragging. You've got to go to Him with a contrite heart. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, it says, Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from, from the Lord out of heaven. That's the law of first mention. Fire is mentioned the first time and is a consuming fire. It consumes Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you know anything about it, it's consumed it all the way down to his, where it's the deepest part of the world. And he consumed it all. And there's nothing left. When you start reading about this, you find out that devouring fire is found five times in the Old Testament. Consuming fire is found two times in the Old Testament and one time in the New, New Testament. That's eight times. Eight is a number for new beginning. It was a new beginning for Moses. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 17, it says, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain, in the eyes of the children of Israel. But before that, Moses, the first time he came in contact with God, he saw a fire, a bush on fire, and it wasn't consumed. Paul, when he met, met God, or Jesus Christ, for the first time, he saw a bright light out of, the, out of the sky, and it blinded him. It was so bright. Peter, James, and John says when the transfiguration took place, his countenance was like the sun. John the Revelator saw Jesus Christ on, sitting on the right hand of the Father, and he saw his countenance was like the brightness of the sun. We're not, we're not messing around with, a, with a, uh, one of these, I hate to even say it, some of these twerps out there that think they're gods, they don't know who God is. They don't even know what God is. And they try to pass themselves off as, as some kind of uh, Messiah because they used to be famous and now their fame is dropping down so they have to grab onto something else so they go to the religious people 
and they start pulling the money away from them. We're, we're in a mess. It just keeps getting worse. How you view God will determine how you worship Him. The Bible says you have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And He will not accept anything other than spirit and truth. Many Christians today are flipping about the way they, they worship. They have their little rock and roll music and their little praise stuff. We need to get serious about who God is. We have to get that straight in our minds. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 14 says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among you shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us will dwell with the everlasting burning? That's who God is. Those, are, those two questions right there are absolutely essential in your Christian life. If you don't understand who God is, how can you accept Him as your Savior? He's a consuming fire. Verse 15 says, Who goes into His presence? In verse 15 it says, He that walketh uprightly... He that speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppression, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. That's who my God is. I'm nothing like him. But I've received Him as my Savior because He went to the cross and He died for me. And now I take on His righteousness. I'm hid in Christ. Are you hid in Christ? If you're not, you're in big trouble. Because your righteousness will not... You won't be able to stand before a righteous God that has an all-consuming fire. He'll burn you to a crisp. There won't be nothing left. You have to have a fireproof body to be in front of my Savior. He's a consuming fire. Psalms chapter 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, and the world, and he that dwelleth therein. For he hath found it upon the sea, and established it on the floods. Who shall ascend to the, into the hill of the Lord? That's a good question. There's only one. And if you're not hitting him, you're not going to get there. It says, Or who shall stand in the holy place? He that hath a clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness, righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face O Jacob, Selah, lift up thy, your heads, O gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Have you opened up your gates? Have you let Him in? He's calling now. Time is running out. You need to get busy. This, this word, Selah, I did a little studying on it this week, and, I, and, and it, everyone says, it, meditate on these things. You know what Selah means? It's a city, a rock city over there, and it's called Petra today. If you look at this, this word, it's found 75 times in the Old Testament. And the first time it's mentioned, it's, it's mentioned about... Petra. When God put this in His Word, He put it in there for a purpose. And it's not to meditate. It's to remind the Jews when the idle shepherd goes into the temple and proclaims himself to be God, Go to Petra! That's where you need to go. But you, 
Gentiles, you need to go to Christ and you need to go now because time is running out. Just look at the world. It is getting so vile. The Pope the other day just declared that uh, fundamental Christianity needs to be done away with and done away with soon because it's interfering with the world church. God the Father loves the nation of Israel as His wife. This is God the Father. And has put His Word where to go when they discover that the Antichrist is sitting in the temple. And if you don't believe me, there's all kinds of passages in the Bible telling the Jews to go to Petra. One of them is found in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16. He that dwelleth on high, colon, his place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. I looked that up and did some study on it. That's Petra. That's where you're going to go. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. So God is taking care of the Jews. He blinded them for a period of time because he re they rejected the Savior. But their eyes are going to be opened up soon. And they're going to have to go to Petra. Their salvation is based on faith and works. Our salvation is based on grace through faith Amen. and not of works, lest any man should boast. But that doesn't excuse us from not working for Him because He bought and paid for us. Amen. And it's very important, and you're going to find out if we get far enough, that you need to start serving the Lord and start living for Him and... It doesn't matter how you start out, it matters how you finish. you got to finish right. And if you finish right, you're going to have something. If you don't finish right, you're going to have absolutely nothing left, and you're going to go into eternity with nothing. I was talking to a man the other day, I said, wouldn't it be terrible to be in this life and have nothing, and then go into eternity with nothing? What a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. If you're going to be in front of my Savior, you've got to have a body like the three Jewish children. You, you've got to be fireproof. And the only way you can be fireproof is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, I'm just going to, for, for the lack of time, those children when they were in the fire, it killed all the people that threw them in the fire, the mighty men. It killed them. It disintegrated because they were, it was so hot. It's a picture of our Savior. But the three Hebrew children, the only thing it burnt was their bonds. And they walked around with the Lord Jesus Christ in the furnace. Praise His name. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, my sons Jacob's are not consumed. You wonder why they're not consumed? God says, I'm not going to consume them. There's going to be a remnant come through. With the Son of God as your Savior, the church and the tribulation Jews will come through the fire unharmed. Our fire is when we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Their fire is going to be a seven year tribulational period. I want to be up there, not down here. Nebuchadnezzar said he heated the furnace seven times hotter than it normal. And that's the way the tribulation is going to be. He says, God, Jesus Christ said himself, he says, there's never been a time like it nor ever will be again. It is going to be horrible. And don't be going around believing these, these TV preachers, sending them your money. You're, you're crazy if you send money to them people. 
We have a consuming fire for God. Don't mess with Him. Don't trifle with Him. Don't try to manipulate Him. He can't be manipulated. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 says, Now this, no, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can't stand before Him. You don't want to stand before Him in this body. John chapter, 1 John chapter 1 verse 3 verse 2 says, or chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We're going to be like Him. So what does that mean? That means that you're going to shine. Some of us. My greatest fear is to stand before Him and have nothing. That's my greatest fear. It's a motivator. Fear is a motivator. And you need to fear this God. You can't trifle with Him. You can't manipulate Him. John, John 1, 12 says, But as many as received Him... To them gave He power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on His name. That's who you have to go to. We're not going to Petra. We're going, you've got to go to Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit or are you led by the flesh? Do you let the flesh have dominion in your life? Do you listen to this rock and roll and country music? Do you go to the movies and watch the, the vile stuff on movies? My goodness, they, they sacrifice for every movie that's put out there. They sacrifice. What are they sacrificing? They sacrifice for the music that goes out. And it's all based on how to manipulate you to serve Satan, the enemy, not the Lord. Even some of this contemporary stuff is vile. Amen. You know, I want to change everybody's mind when it comes to everyone's going to be happy in heaven. Not everybody's going to be happy. A lot of them are going to walk away sad and regretting that I didn't live for the Lord Jesus Christ when I had a chance. And there's people out there that are going to be there that are going to suffer loss. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to His image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 6 says, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunders and with earthquakes and great noise, with storms and tempests, and the flame of devouring fire. That's when Jesus Christ returns. I don't want to be here. I want to be up there coming back with Him. That's the safest place to be. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 27 says, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from afar, burning with anger, and burning thereof is heavy. His lips is full of indignation, and His tongue as a devouring fire. Verse 30, And the Lord shall cause His glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lightning down, his arm, down of His arm, with indignation of His anger, and with the flames of devouring fires, with scattering and tempests and hailstones. I don't want to be here. To be burnt by the flame that comes from the Father, from the, our Lord Jesus Christ, and then to be in eternity in hell, where there's burning and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever, never ending. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 1 says, Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people, let the earth hear 
and all that is therein, the world and all the things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. That's including God bless America. And God can't bless America. You should be praying God have mercy on America. Because America is one of the vilest countries in the world. I pray for America. Pray for our leaders. The Lord of glory is angry because the world has rejected His Son and rejected His Word and has tried to pass off their dirty rags as equal to His righteousness. What a joke. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 16 says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. God's word's not going to fail. You can see it coming. It's coming soon. Are you ready? John chapter 5 verse 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The whole book is about him. Anyone who studied the word of God knows that this book is about him. And it's marvelous in every every sense of the matter, every every way you can think possible. I mean, I find things all the time. I'm thinking, wow, I never saw that. But man, Revelation chapter 19, it says, His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. What's his name? The Word of God. This Word is important. I was talking to a guy this week, and I was surprised when he's, I asked him what Bible are you reading. He says, I read from the King James. I said, praise the Lord. I said, that's great. I said, you're a step ahead of everybody. Jesus has given all for you to be saved and to reject His gift of eternal life is to accept the wrath of the Almighty God, that devouring fire. And no one is going to escape. No one. Exodus chapter 19 verse 14 says, And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto them, Be ye ready against the third day. Come not into your wives. And it came to pass that on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and thick and a thick cloud upon the mount, and a voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud, and all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the neither part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire." Read that. That's a picture of the second advent. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And, we, you know, if you don't read the Old Testament, you're not going to have any idea who God is. He's not that baby in a manger. I get mad at every time this year, you know, people say, oh, that's terrible. No, I know who I'm serving. And ain't no baby in a manger. He was a baby. God incarnate in a man. Praise the Lord. But when He comes back, He's not going to be on a cross. 
He's not going to be a little uh, hippie. He's going to be a consuming fire. And when we stand before Him, He's going to be... I wish I was an artist. Well, I guess I am an artist, but I wish I could paint. But I can't paint anything like that. When you look at this third day, and I've maybe said this before, it's amazing to me, the third day is found 52 times in 48 verses throughout the Bible. A sample of it is Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. And after two days, He will revive us. In the third day, He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. Wow, that's, that's talking about the second advent. We'll live in His sight. Who's He talking to? Jews. But John chapter 2, verse 1, the first miracle that God create, ever created, He's very specific here. He says, and the third day there was a marriage in Canaan. Well, when this is going on down here with the tribulation, we're going to be up there at a wedding. And that wedding is between the Lord Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ. And that's us. Amen. But the seventh day is also found 52 times in 48 verses. Guess how many days how many times six day is found? Six times. <laughs> but this stuff is amazing to me. But Hebrews chapter four, verse four is an example of the seventh day. For he spake a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day and all of all his works. That is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It happens on the seventh day. It's not a thousand years from now. We're right there right now. It's about to happen. Are you ready? Do you know Him? I'm not talking about this, this egotistical Christianity a lot of people have. I'm talking about sincere desire to please God. like Abraham. What will we look like? Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says, And they shall be, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's quite a heritage there. Exodus chapter 34 Verse 29, Moses went up to the top of the mountain. When he came down with the two tablets, his, he'd been with Jesus. He'd been with God. And his face did shine. And his skin shined. And they had to put a veil over him. That's our heritage. That's who we're going to be one day if you're born again. Matthew, the rewards that we get. Matthew chapter 19 verse 29 says, And every one that hath forsaken house, or brethren, and sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my sake shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Have you forsaken everything to serve God? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of works. Everybody likes that part. Lest any man should boast. And I like it too. But, read verse 10. Always add verse 10 in. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're ordained to do good works. So what is your good work? Studying your Bible, learning who Jesus Christ is, praying, and you got one that you got one thing that no one else has that God gave you. And you're to use that one thing. And we're going to I'm going to give you scripture for it. 
that one thing, and that's your testimony. Your testimony is not like anyone else's in, in the room. Everyone has a testimony that's different from the other person's testimony. And you can tell other people what Jesus Christ has done for you. Matthew chapter 25. There's two parables concerning money. There's a parable of the talents and there's a parable of the pounds in Luke chapter 19. Matthew chapter 25, it says, verse 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servant to, to deliver them, to them his goods. Now, if, if two things have different characters, two stories have different characters, they have different words, and they have different spellings, and the stories are similar, but they're not the same, you can guarantee one thing, they're not the same. Luke didn't make a mistake, and Matthew didn't make a mistake. These are stories that God gave both of them. In verse 15 it says, Unto one he gave five talents, unto another two, unto another one, and every man according to his several abilities, and straightway took his journey. If he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, what, what time is he talking about? He's talking about the tribulational period. These are the Jews. This is 144,000 that are sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. He gives them talents. Talents is a Jewish form of money or weight. It's not a Gentile. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 20 it says, And so he had received five talents, came, brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered to me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. That's wonderful. He did, he did what he was supposed to do. He went out and preached and won people to Christ. Works, faith and works. Remember that. And then he comes to the last one. He has one talent. And that talent says, he says, And when he had received the one talent, he said unto the Lord, I knew that thou wert a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sowed, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. I was afraid, and went and hid my talent in the earth. And lo, there, there thou hast that is thine." He hid it, he kept it, and he brought it back. Then God judges him. He says, Thou oughtest therefore have put my money in exchangers. And when I had come, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that has ten talents. For ev unto everyone that hath is given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away which he hath. Look at verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He goes to hell. We're talking about the tribulational period. God gives him a, a task. He gives him a talent. And that talent is to take the gospel to the world. And he hid it. And he survived. And when he got to judgment, he was cast into the lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we come to the parable of 
Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is not the same. It doesn't read the same. It doesn't have the same characters. It doesn't have the same currency. It doesn't even have the same numbers. Look at this. Luke chapter 19 verse 12 says, He therefore said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. Ten, ten, ten. Ten is the number for Gentiles. If you have any questions about it, I'll show you later. It's all about the Gentiles. That Gentiles is us. These servants is us. And he said unto the ten servants, Deliver them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. What did Christ tell us when he left? Occupy till I come. Verse 14 says, But the citizens hated him, and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to rule over us. The nation of Israel rejected him. He blinds them. And it came to pass that after, uh, that, that then he was returned, having received his kingdom. Who gives him his kingdom? During the tribulational period. And this is while the Jews are down here with their talents, we're up there with our pounds, given an account at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to show you where that when we're finished with the, the, merit, the, the uh, judgment seat of Christ, then we come back. And he called unto him and said, He had given the money that it might now, that, that he knows now, much every man had gained by trading. Everyone gets one. Remember what that one thing is? That's your testimony. Everyone has influence on somebody. When he came to the first, he said, Lord, thy pound has gained five pounds. And he said unto him, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities. The people in talents didn't get anything. But these people are given ten, he's given ten cities for make, taking one pound and making five. Or ten. And he said to the second, Lord, thy pound has made five pounds. And he says, great. And he likewise to him, be thou over five cities. Look what you can do with one talent or one pound. Your testimony. Everything is about eternity. It's not about right now. It's about eternity. But there's one guy that hid his, talent, his pound. And another came and saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound. And he's proud of it. Which I have kept laid up in a napkin. He hid it. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up where thou layest not down, and reapest not that thou didst not sow. But he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth I will judge thee, wicked servant." Because you knew who I was. You knew that I, I pick up where I don't sow, or I reap where I don't sow, and I, I'm an austere man. Here's the sad part. Verse 24, because we're running out of time. He said unto him, to them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. 
And he says, wait a minute. He says, Lord, they, they said unto him, Lord, he had 10 pounds. Why'd you leave this guy with one pound? That unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. He doesn't go to hell. He goes into eternity with nothing. What a depressing thought. But look at verse 27. He says, But those mine enemies, which would not have me to reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. That's the world that rejected him, the world that hated him, the world that we're living in right now. He says, kill them all. It's better to be behind him than in front of him. It's better to be for him than against him. We go into eternity, we have the opportunity to win five crowns. And they're easy. It's not hard. It's easy. You just got to put your focus on the one who's going to give them to you. The Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a wonderful thing to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, he says, that will work for an incorruptible crown. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 says, my joy and crown... So stand fast in the Lord, just standing fast, holding to His Word and not letting, being swayed by every new doctrine that comes along. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 says, A crown of rejoicing, to be excited when Jesus Christ appears and takes His church out of here. And if you're excited about that, like I am, you'll get a crown for it. And you know what else you do? Whenever you're looking for His coming at any time, you're living right. And you're trying to do right. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 says, Henceforth there is laid up to, for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them Amen. also, the, the love my his appearing. James chapter one verse two says that enduring temptation, not listening to 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 the music of this world, rejecting it, saying no, I don't want it. I want my mind to be clear so I can think on the things of God, and not be rattled by this this music of today. That's Guarantees will brainwash you. Amen. You get a crown of life. So what are we going to do with these crowns? That's the best part. Amen. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 it says, Fear none of these things which ye suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that ye may be tried. Ye shall have temptation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Boy, wouldn't that be a great crown? A lot of people are getting this crown of life right now. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11 says, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which I have, and let no man take your crown. Don't let anyone, don't let your friends influence the way you think and the way you act. Do right. Always do right. That's what I lived, I grew up here in all my life. Do right, always do right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Revelation chapter um, 2, verse, or 2 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that everyone may receive the things done in this body according to hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Do right. Romans chapter 14 verse 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou not thy brother? For we shall all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't worry about the person beside you. Worry about you. When you're married... You're kind of like partners in what you receive at the judgment seat of Christ if both of you are saved. Every man's work shall be made manifest. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, and shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. That's that devouring fire. And if there's anything left after that fire, that's what you're going to get. But one day, you're going to take that crown, those crowns that you're given, for serving the Lord and doing right, and you're going to be able, to, you're going to have the honor, the honor of casting them before His feet. And when He returns, He has many crowns on His head. What a privilege. What what a wonderful thing to stand before the consuming fire, the one who created all things in the universe and holds everything together. That's a, you know, when I was working, you go to these classes about nuclear fusion and all this stuff, and the one thing they, they didn't know is what held everything together. Why didn't it all just blow up? Because he says, because of him, all things consist. They're held together by Him. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to have a better idea of who You are so that we can better serve You. Lord, help us to have a fear of God, but not only that, but help us to have a, a deeper love for You and that a God, this all-powerful God, came to earth, was born of a woman, suffered and died on the cross of Calvary, rose again on the third day and is now at the right hand of the Father wanting those that are lost to come to Him and to come soon because time's running out. There should be an urgency in this room to hear that their loved ones have been saved. I pray, Lord, for the Ed Williams family, Lord, and I know that Ed is rejoicing today because of you. Others have lost their loved ones that are with you right now, and we rejoice in their home going. And Lord, help us to be looking for your coming. Help us to be rejoicing when you do return, and not to be in fear. For we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.